The Unshackled Waves, Episode 105. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. A lot is still happening in Australian politics and elsewhere, so there's plenty to discuss and analyse. We will do this as always with Unshackled contributor Jacob Watts. This is the Unshackled Waves Review Show. Jacob, welcome back to the show. G'day, Tim. It's uh, it's good to be back for another week, the Unshackled Waves. And certainly Australian politics is proving to be uh, as volatile as the last time that we spoke. Yes, it hasn't appeared to settle down. Uh, there seems to be some kind of virus uh, infecting the coalition. Uh, we, we we're seeing a banking uh, royal commission. We're seeing instability in the coalition. And there's so much to talk about. Well, all the signs have been pointing to Malcolm Turnbull's uh, prime ministership being terminal. Uh, last week there was the, the leaks out of Cabinet, then there was the unnamed coalition MP threatening to quit unless Turnbull was replaced, which is now, now revealed as George Christensen of the Nationals. Then this week, of course, uh, you mentioned there was the stunning backflip on the Banking Royal Commission after uh, saying for so long that they weren't, weren't going to do it. They, they announced it on Thursday. And then uh, probably worst of all was the New South Wales uh, Deputy Premier and State Nationals Leader, John Barillaro, openly uh, calling for Malcolm Turnbull to quit when he was on uh, 2GB uh, with Alan Jones on Friday. And of course, next week is the uh, final uh, sitting week of Parliament before the summer break, which is known as the uh, parliamentary killing season when leadership challenges are launched. So... Uh, it's not out of the realm of possibility that we could see some sort of leadership move uh, this week. Well, yeah, and obviously we're seeing uh, John Howard uh, supporting uh, Malcolm Turnbull here out of an act of desperation. Uh, John Howard is a man who I admire greatly. I've uh, read two of his books now, The Menzies Era and Lazarus Rising, but I don't know how Howard... Uh, has come to support this Banking Royal Commission as well when he called it rank socialism the other week. So we're seeing backflips, uh, we're seeing a lot of division, and we're seeing, uh, you know, toxic, toxic kind of uh, Canberra culture uh, underway here in this last week. Uh, it's, it's always been interesting... Uh... Malcolm Turnbull and John Howard's uh, political alignment with each other because they both come from different factions of the Liberal Party. But when Malcolm Turnbull, when he first ran for Parliament in the seat of Wentworth, uh, Bill Heffernan, who was John Howard's right-hand man, was his unofficial uh, campaign manager. And then, of course, when Turnbull was going to uh, retire after he lost the leadership in 2009, uh, John Howard encouraged uh, Turnbull to stay. And, of course... Uh, there, there was this intervention this weekend, which were, it was it was pretty uh, uh, a strong endorsement of a uh, Turnbull by um, uh, John Howard, who obviously still has a large amount of respect in the Liberal Party. I mean, he's the second longest serving uh, prime minister. Uh, that, uh, in my opinion, that might you know, starve off a a leadership challenge in the short term, but in the end it's going to come down to if Liberal MPs, if they feel that they're going off a cliff with uh, Mal Malcolm Turnbull, then uh, you know, they'll replace him. That, that, that's politics 101. It will happen. Uh, and at the end of the day, John Howard mentioned this in his autobiography, he would have been deposed uh, prior to the 2007 election if the party felt that he was not the candidate to win them the election. You know, politics is not a sentimental game. It's not a game, uh, you know, of, of loyalty at the end of the day. It's a game of winning. It's a game of numbers. And I'm sure uh, Malcolm Turnbull, uh, being an incredibly smart man, uh, would realise this. Um, but it seems that he is making all the wrong decisions uh, to get himself canned. And, and this really surprises me. From such a smart man, he does not seem to be such a shrewd politician. 
It, it was incredible with the Banking World Commission. They said that they uh, announced it to end the uh, political uh, instability around the issue and the, the economic uh, damage uh, caused by uh, speculation, and it was rightfully pointed out if if you thought a you know banking royal commission uh, was going to lead to economic uncertainty, why are you why, why are you calling it? That makes no sense. Well, in a sense, fundamentally, uh, Malcolm Turnbull disagrees with the nature of the banking royal commission. So does uh, the, the great John Howard and Scott but Morrison. And Scott Morrison, they all disagree with it. But the reason why they're going ahead with it is is a politically swift move, and it is to take the wind out of the sails of the um, the Labor Party at the next election. You know, the the classic kind of line, uh, the the banks versus battlers. It will take that away from them. And also another thing that might give the Liberal Party some hope as well is Sam Dastyari's, you know, apparent uh, corruption as well. They seem to be the two things that the Liberal Party are harping on about, and uh, they seem to be the life support for the Liberal Party and for Malcolm Turnbull at the moment. Well, uh, T Turnbull, um, well, I'm not sure if it was his victory, but he had uh, somewhat of an in, uh, important uh, victory last night with the uh, New England by-election, which was caused by uh, Barnaby Joyce uh, being found to be a New Zealand citizen by the High Court back in October. Barnaby Joyce was easily uh, re-elected as the uh, member for uh, New England, and uh, Malcolm Turnbull was uh, by his side uh, uh, during Barnaby Joyce's victory speech, and uh, Barnaby Joyce also offered a, a strong uh, endorsement of Malcolm Turnbull's leadership, uh, stating that, you know, it's, it's a hard job being, you know, a pr a Prime Minister and, you know, uh, Malcolm Turnbull's managing well and said he's looking forward to uh, going back to work with uh, this bloke, and he, he's certainly better than uh, Bill Shorten. And given that it's the Nationals uh, MPs who uh, forced this Royal Commission onto Malcolm Turnbull, and uh, dare I say, you know, going a bit rogue uh, in Barnaby Joyce's uh, absence, it's it's certainly another uh, big gun of the coalition who has come to Malcolm Turnbull's defence. Well, it seems that. Uh, Barnaby Joyce is supporting Malcolm Turnbull here so the Labor Party don't get re-elected. Now, any sitting Nationals member, well, we've got Senator Bridget McKenzie here in Victoria. Well, she was lucky to get in. But besides that, all the Nationals seem to be in safe seats. If we look at Christensen, if we look at Andrew Broad, for instance, in the Mallee, uh, getting nearly 80% of the vote. If we look at Barnaby Joyce in New England, nearly getting 80% of the vote. The you, you could get Barnaby Joyce, you could, or you could get Andrew Broad, or you could get uh, George Christensen. They could shoot someone in the middle of the street, and their you know their numbers might go down by 20%. It doesn't matter. That's why the uh, co co uh, that's why the Nationals are standing by Malcolm Turnbull here, even though he's weak. Uh, because for the country, uh, a Labor government would be detrimental. But one also has to remember. I myself have spent a lot of time in country Victoria. Uh, one has to remember that the the National Party in itself is mostly conservative but it doesn't follow a strict political philosophy. It doesn't have that John Stuart Mill wing and that Burkean wing like the Liberal Party does. It's a country first party. So sometimes um, you will see uh, some uh, policy that is left wing, especially economically. And the other thing is uh, we have to remember uh, historically the banks have always given farmers a very, very hard time. Um, so it's not just the battlers who are angry with the banks, but it is also the farmers. Now, I certainly don't think this is the right way to go about it. Uh, farmers feed our nation. They're great people. They deserve to be treated with respect. But I can understand why uh, there has been this kind of undermining of Malcolm Turnbull's uh, power, political power base uh, from the National Party, um, just purely... Uh, 
for their own sake of, I guess, wanting to shore up their base of uh, rural and country people who have been hard done by by the banks, who have had their farms taken away, uh, for instance, yeah. Well, New England was an easy by-election for the coalition because Labor pretty much uh, ran dead, which was reflected in the fact that their primary vote was a pathetic 11%. But, of course, uh, the the real test for you know Malcolm Turnbull and the coalition will be the Benelong by-election, which will be in two weeks on uh, December 16th, where uh, Labor is definitely um, launch, having a big uh, effort there with their star candidate, uh, Christina Keneally. And if if that seat goes the, the way of Labor, well, not only will it be damaging for Malcolm Turnbull, but he'll lose his majority in the House of Representatives. If Malcolm Turnbull's Liberal Party loses the Benelong by-election, what will happen is he will be in an induced coma. Uh, he will be relying on the party uh, power brokers uh, to feed him liquefied food uh, when he's laying destitute in a bed. So if he loses Benelong, Malcolm Turnbull is more or less over within the next six months. So it is vital that John Alexander uh, picks picks Benelong up because God help us all if Bill Shorten gets in power. I just can't imagine what he'd do. But talking about the Banking Royal Commission, if it's done on Liberal and the banks kind of terms of reference, it's a lot better than Bill Shorten uh, kind of destroying our whole economy. But, but all in all, principally... 100% against it, and we we um, we really do hope that uh, John Alexander wins Benelong. Labor Senator Sam Dastiari, or Shanghai Sam, or Slippery Sam, as he is also uh, known, was uh, back in the news this week uh, due to his links with uh, Chinese businessman Hung Zangimo. Uh, I think I've pronounced that r right. Uh, it was uh, revealed that uh, during a meeting with uh, Mr. Hong, he uh, tip tipped him off that his uh, phone may be being tapped by uh, ASIO and that they should continue their uh, conversation uh, outside of uh, his uh, Mossman mansion where the meeting was being held. And then uh, on top of that, there was audio released uh, of a press conference Sam Destiari held with Mr. Wong uh, where he uh, uh, contradicted Labor's policy and the government's policy on the South China Sea. Now, we already knew about this uh, press conference, but Sam Dastyari said that oh, it was a, an answer to uh, a, a, a question that he was unprepared for, but the audio revealed that it was a, a carefully uh, scripted uh, remark. So Sam's initial uh, explanation uh, turned out to be com complete crap. Uh, now, uh, Sam Dastyari, he's resigned from his uh, position as uh, Deputy Senate Whip, which he was promoted to five months uh, after he uh, ha had to resign from the Labor front bench uh, when, when the first revelations about his relationship with Mr Huang uh, came into the, to the media spotlight. But now there's uh, calls for him to, you know, go from Parliament since he has basically undermined Australia's national interest and also undermined our security agencies and uh, also lied about uh, uh, what really happened. Well, in 1983, uh, Bob Hawke, uh, I can't remember the lad's name, but he sacked a, uh, a Labor Party uh, member from the party for a very similar reason. Now, if... Bill Shorten were to be a stronger leader, uh, he would have done the same thing. And I think the country would have admired uh, Mr. Shorten uh, for doing, you know, such an uh, such a deed. Uh, but you know, he he also you hear Mr. Shorten uh, on uh, television on radio, and what he does is he's doing enough to appease News Corp and the right-wingers by, say, um, stripping him of his duty. Uh, but he's also doing enough to appease the left faction, you know, who don't mind selling out Australia to the communists uh, by saying that, you know, he hasn't broken any laws. So 
Sam Dastyari is causing a bit of instability uh, within Labor within Labor ranks at the moment, no doubt. But whether Mr Hung would have known that his phone would have been hacked if he was some kind of master spy that they make him out to be, as Richo said on Sky News the other, he probably would have known. So in a sense... I don't think you know he would have uh, you know unveiled some kind of revelation to Mr. Hunk, but I also uh, think that the 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 spirit of what he was doing uh, was was kind of uh, contravening uh, uh, the the essence of, of what a parliamentarian is meant to stand for. They're meant to uh, be uh, a man or a woman of integrity, of of honesty. Uh, and someone who serves their constituency and their country uh, before anyone else. And certainly, I don't think uh, Sam Dastyari's mind was on serving his people, but it was more so on securing the $400,000 uh, from this Communist Party-linked, uh, I guess you could call him a sugar daddy for, for the two major parties. That was his main interest. Uh, and uh, now Bill Shorten said that oh, Sam Dastyari is at the back of the queue when uh, it comes to promotion to the front bench for the government, and a lot of people in the media are saying, "Well, why should you know he? Why should there ever be the possibility that he can you know hold a, a senior position in government, given that?" Uh, we don't know where his loyalties lie, and uh, given that, shouldn't he you know, go from the parliament? And his statement to the Senate, which uh, it wasn't given voluntarily, he was, uh, the government forced him to make a statement to the Senate, it didn't address the, the new allegations. Uh, he, he just said, oh, you know, the, uh, this uh, press conference, uh, uh, it, you know, it was already on the pub public record that it happened and I resigned from the front bench. He, he didn't uh, address the fact that, you know, he'd misled the people about, you know, how the uh, press conference unfolded. And it also didn't uh, address the um, allegation that he, that he tipped Mr Hong off about his uh, f uh, phone being tapped. And uh, also, uh, given that he he knew, uh, Sam Jastiari knew that, you know, ASIO uh, would be listening to Mr Hong's phone, like, what was... Uh, what was Sam Dastyari going to tell him that he didn't want ASIO to hear? Because Sam Dastyari said that he went to meet with Mr Hong to basically break up with him, uh, saying, you know, there's no chance for, for us to uh, work together. It was also pointed out that it was... Uh, if Sam knew that uh, Mr Hong's phone was being tapped, why did, he, uh, why did he say it out loud? I mean, in those you know, espionage movies, when you know someone's phone's, you know, being tapped, you, you write a note and say, your phone's being tapped, let's talk outside. Well, two things are going on here, Tim. Uh, one, Sam Dastyari is not a very bright man, and that's probably reiterated by the fact that he's a member of the Australian Labor Party as well. Uh, that, that That's why he said it out loud. And now the the fact is, where did this leak come from? That's what I find interesting. I actually don't f find the the whole discussion about ethics be too interesting because we know it's wrong what he's done. But has the leak in itself uh, come from the intelligence community, and uh, and kind of what effect does that have on our national security? Now that that's something that I find interesting as well. Uh, or whether it has been a, a politically savvy leak um, as well to co kind of bolster uh, Malcolm Turnbull's position. Uh, but to the point, uh, I think that uh, Sam Dastyari has done his dash. I don't think he's done, you know, anything criminal per se, but he's, he's handled himself uh, so unethically and uh, with with such a little amount of dignity that the people of New South Wales probably can't invest their trust in him anymore, uh, which is a shame. But but I've been thinking about uh, future career options for Senator Dastiari. One of them is is set him up with a, an halal cooking show uh, in a local community TV station in Western Sydney, 
And I think that is the next uh, logical step for this man. Uh, are you sure it's, uh, it wouldn't be a, a Chinese cooking show? Uh, maybe maybe the uh, stir-fry segment would come in in the last half hour. You've uh, got to appease the minority groups and the uh, communist sugar daddies. Uh, well, uh, well, it was reported this week that, you know, Sam, he's eyeing off a career in uh, television and radio. So it, it seems like even Sam's realising that uh, the writing's on the, on the wall. I mean, uh, as we mentioned before, uh, of Labour and Bill Shorten, because, you know, Sam Desiari is so uh, factionally uh, pow uh, powerful and, you know, knows how to, you know, get money from donors and, you know, know, know uh, and knows where the, the bodies are buried, uh, to use the uh, political term, that... Uh, and, and it seems to be the Labour Party, they always, you know, stick by their, um, you know, their mates, no matter how how wrong their actions are for longer than uh, the right side of politics who, you know, have, have more often than not immediately, you know, cu uh, cut their, um, uh, their senior members loose. Well, th this might be a claim that could get me in some trouble, but what I think it is to do with is that the right side of politics is more values-based. Uh, more members uh, of the Liberal Party are people of faith uh, who, who actually care about these ethical considerations. And I think that the Labor Party uh, only and solely care about increasing the size of government, increasing the purview and power of unions, and they don't really care about honesty, humility and the truth. Uh, and I think this is clear uh, with the case of uh, Senator Dastiari. It's time for a Queensland election update. Uh, it's one week after uh, election day, which we uh, did our election night uh, live stream. Uh, we predicted that probably the uh, Labor Party, would, uh, led by Premier Anastasia Palaszczuk, would just get over the line. And it now looks like that is all but certain uh, Labor will get uh, 47 or 48 seats out of the the 93 there. So there's in the aftermath, there's been uh, a, a lot of uh, reflection on whether the Liberal National Party performance uh, is related to the federal uh, performance of the federal government and also the um, the role of uh, One Nation uh, assisting the, the Labor Party and also its uh, relative uh, strength. Now, I believe that this was uh, an election fought on, you know, state issues. Basically, when I say state issues, I, I mean that Tim Nichols <laughs> wasn't a very good uh, leader and didn't run a good campaign, didn't make the, the the case for change. But certainly nobody can deny that One Nation, with their uh, preference policy of uh, preferencing every sitting member uh, last, uh, really, you know, assisted the Labor Party uh, to uh, get over the line. And there's been a lot of anger uh, amongst uh, so, uh, some conservatives that One Nation has done this and basically uh, re-elected a progressive uh, government which is in a lot of ways uh, against the values of One Nation. Yes, well I think the reason being that what the results were uh, was Tim Nichols, uh, we said this on the election coverage, uh, he couldn't give a straight answer to any number of questions. Now, I would prefer uh, to face Brett Lee blindfolded for an hour and uh, get barraged by balls and have broken ribs uh, than listen to Tim Nichols for an hour. Uh, he is that painful and awful to listen to, uh, and he really just, for me, personifies uh, <clears throat> the, the breakdown of, of politics uh, from the people. Uh, Paul, he doesn't really care about Queenslanders too much and he was trying to be far too labour light. And that's why many uh, of the right uh, voted for Catters Australia Party, voted for One Nation and uh, therefore uh, that drained a lot of votes out of the Liberal National Party, a lot of votes that they couldn't afford to be drained out of the party. Um, I think that if they had a more a charismatic, uh, a more, um, how do you say, conviction 
uh, style politician uh, who was uh, who was a true uh, conservative, who was uh, a true centre right politician, uh, they would have got across the line early because we, we definitely saw some seats, 20% One Nation, 20% LNP, 20% Qatar, and then uh, they, they go 30% uh, Labor. Now, you can tell by those figures there that clearly there were some conservative electorates that voted, uh, that, that voted in a Labor member because of the breakdown of the right. And the sheer fact that uh, Tim Nichols uh, is, uh, you know, probably a good man, but not a great politician. And uh, many uh, of those right-wing votes went to minor parties because the Liberal Party are no longer a right-wing or a conservative party as such. Well, Tim Nichols was in denial uh, all week, refusing to uh, concede defeat, uh, probably because he wants to hang on to the job of opposition leader for as long as possible. Now, uh, we mentioned previously the tensions between the Liberals and uh, Nationals at a federal level. Uh, well, that is reflected by the fact that uh, they have different approaches to dealing with uh, One Nation. Uh, George Brandis called uh, dealing with uh, One Nation uh, poison. Uh, meanwhile, uh, nationals uh, such as well George Christensen, he offered an apology for the uh, on behalf of the LNP to One Nation voters for uh, letting you down. And Matt Canavan uh, said that it's important for the nationals to maintain a separate identity uh, at a federal level. So there, there are certainly uh, you know, mi uh, mixed feelings within the uh, the coalition about how to deal with the the One Nation factor. Well, I think that uh, One Nation, um, it's all a storm in a teacup. I'm really sick of talking about it. Uh, they're not go ever going to be a successful party uh, purely for the fact that they have a very, very centralised leadership structure um, and, you know, the, the whole preferences as you managed before, m mentioned before, uh, One Nation are never going to be anything more than a conversation or three or four seats in the Australian Senate at a double dissolution or, you know, two or three seats at most in the Queensland Parliament. So I think it's all a bit of a storm in a teacup, to be honest with you, Tim. I doubt that there would be this uh, problem uh, for the coalition when dealing with Australian Conservatives because they would naturally do um, or preference the Liberals and Nationals despite, you know, obviously their differences with them and uh, vice versa, where uh, One Nation, they, people view them as a right-wing party, but they've they've got supporters, you know, from both the right and Labor working class voters, which is, I think, one of the reasons they made this preference decision in the Queensland state election is because they were spooked by the backlash to their uh, Western Australian state election preference deal with the, the Liberals, which was uh, deemed to have uh, backfired on them. So uh, definitely with this, you know, One Nation being, you know, pushed in all, all these different directions, um, does it open the possibility that, you know, maybe now the, you know, Australian Conservatives and Cory Bernardi can you know, say, well, you know, we're the, um, you know, the real alternative for, for voters? Well, it's a good point you make because I think that in the majority of cases, uh, Australian Conservatives are disaffected uh, Liberals of the Conservative faction. But I think that One Nation voters are disaffected uh, Labor voters of the right faction. So uh, One Nation preferences, I think, will always go to the Labor Party. Uh, and I think that... Uh, that's the key difference between the Australian Conservatives and the Liberals because the Australian Conservative voter may preference Australian Conservatives first, may preference Liberals second, may preference uh, the National Party third. So I think it's a different game to the One Nation voter who say may hypothetically preference uh, the One Nation, uh, you know, say first and then uh, the Labor Party second. So it's a whole different kettle of fish. And I'm not very comfortable 
uh, getting behind One Nation so much. I like their uh, energy policy. I like their immigration policy to a large degree. Obviously, some facets I disagree with. They're obviously a party with a few good policies, but I think they are really old Labor uh, right faction uh, kind of uh, Bush uh, politicians, and uh, and I think where the principles lie uh, more so. Not to say that they don't lie in One Nation as well, but I think where the principles do lie is in Australian Conservatives, and I think that the benefit of such a party. Uh, would be to draw the Liberal Party uh, to become more of a Conservative Party. And I hope we see that in the next Queensland election, um, that it could actually work uh, to the LNP's advantage by making them more so a party of principles rather than a party of broken promises and populism. Because in reality, like the rise of the Greens, I mean, it hasn't affected Labor too much because all the Greens' preferences just work their way uh, back to uh, the Labor Party. Um, but with regard to Australian Conservatives, they obviously have their first uh, electoral test coming up in the, the Benelog by-election. That, that will be an important uh, side uh, factor there. So um, obviously, you know, One Nation is where all the the protest vote is is going currently. But you know, will it be able to you know filter to strong conservatives who you know we both agree is a more well rounded party? Well, it certainly is. Uh, it's a party of people who uh, care actually about uh, keeping this country uh, going. Really. And I think One Nation is a protest. Australian Conservatives balance both innovation and tradition to a great level. You look at, say, the nuclear policy, and uh, then you look at, say, uh, their, you know, veneration of Judeo-Christian value of espoused in policy. So I think that uh, the Australian Conservatives offer what John Howard used to offer Australians in the early 2000s. Uh, but we're not seeing that anymore. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there have been some really good One Nation politicians. We look at, say, Pauline Hanson and Malcolm Roberts. What they've actually done to uh, the, the realm of ideas has been incredible, especially on immigration and climate change. But I think they're too much a one or two issue party and they don't have a well-rounded platform, as you said, Tim. So I'm hoping that in Queensland and in Bannalong, uh, the Australian Conservatives can get some traction because certainly here in Victoria they've already got a quarter of the size of the Liberal Party uh, in membership here in the state of Victoria. Uh, so certainly I think that this will change the dynamics of, of state politics and of federal politics in years to come uh, if they are to keep up this immaculate growth. <laughs> United States President Donald Trump has uh, landed himself in trouble again uh, fr uh, from some tweets. Uh, this time it was because he uh, retweeted uh, three uh, videos from the, the deputy leader of uh, Britain First, uh, which purportedly shows uh, uh, violence perpetrated by Muslims against uh, persons and property. Now, this was uh, condemned by uh, British Prime Minister Theresa May through uh, a spokesperson initially who described uh, Britain First as a organisation that spreads uh, hate. Uh, Trump responded on Twitter by saying that uh, May should focus on the uh, radical uh, Islamic uh, terrorism that is occurring with it within her country. Uh, rather than uh, focusing on uh, his tweets. Uh, what got me about this, because, uh, you know, yes, like, tr Trump, you know, he, he causes a lot of controversy with his tweets, but it, it seemed there, there was more outrage at the fact that uh, somebody was willing to, you know, post um, inst instances of Islamic violence and terrorism rather than being outraged by Islamic violence and terrorism of itself? I wouldn't, uh, well, somewhat agree, but I think the issue is not what he has tweeted uh, so much, uh, but it's more so of who he has retweeted. Um, uh, obviously, Britain uh, has a class establishment, 
and there's these middle class, uh, sorry, not middle class, working class uh, folks who are saying enough. Obviously, I don't agree with all the baggage that they carry, but uh, they, they are saying enough. And then uh, Theresa May hasn't actually been, I don't think, outraged as to as to what uh, Trump has retweeted as such, uh, but she is more so being outraged uh, by the fact that he had the quote unquote audacity uh, to uh, um, retweet a, a far right uh, group. Now, I, I before we proceed with this. Um, segment. Firstly, I'd want to establish a few things. I have been following Britain first, not as a fan, but as more so uh, a curious uh, bystander. And I have seen participants uh, in Britain first rallies who are uh, brown, who are black. Um, and, I, I, and in British Parliament, they were apparently some kind of white supremacy organisation because they are against their country being flooded by third world uh, Islamic migrants. Uh, I think that they are a silly party, but what I can agree with uh, is the fact that they want to, to minimise uh, the, the, the Islamification of Britain and of the West. And I think that's something that we all need to stand up for, is is not saying that we don't like brown people or we don't like Muslims, but we uh, we want them, uh, if they are to come here, uh, to respect, but also to venerate our cultures, custom, customs and traditions. And that is not happening. But I'm sure that, Tim, you would agree that they aren't neo-Nazis. Uh, they aren't white supremacists. But in fact, they are an all-over-the-shop kind of uh, activist organisation that is basically just against uh, mass immigration. No, they're definitely not. And, you know, if you actually bother to, you know, read their website or mission statement, they make clear that they're you know, not a, you know, white nationalist, anti-Semitic uh, organisation. Now, they're both a political party and a street movement, which is what gets them into trouble because they hold uh, demonstrations about you know, various issues that they're concerned with. And, of course, whenever that happens, you know, the, uh, you know, leftist groups, you know, the socialist Antifa always turn up to, you know, counter protest protest and try and provoke violence, which is why uh, a lot of their leadership have um, been arrested uh, because, you know, they've been trying to, uh, you know, defend themselves against leftist aggression and also the fact that, you know, there's not a lot of free speech in the UK. So, you know, you can be saying something, you know, uh, what most people consider, you know, fair, fair comment, but the police arrest you for, you know, perpetrating uh, hatred. So that, so that's why, um, in the, there's this appearance that, you know, Britain First is, you know, a, you know, extremist criminal organisation. Well, in fact, uh, we should really thank Britain First because one of the major things that they did uh, was chase down um, Adam Chowdhury who was an ISIS, an ISIS preacher in Britain. He was preaching for the caliphate. You know, he, he stood by uh, the guy who murdered, who beheaded as Lee Rigby in public. And now they get denounced as racist, anti-Semitic and awful uh, because they aren't uh, champagne-sipping Tories. Certainly... I think they're, you know, a bunch of rabble rousers. I don't really agree with them, but you have to give them credit. Uh, they they put Anjum Chowdhury behind bars, a man who was wanting a caliphate, a man who was calling uh, on his followers in some cases, uh, I believe, to uh, actually join ISIS. And uh, they, they have made some progress. Uh, and... And they actually uh, got in trouble. Well, they did harass uh, this ISIS hate preacher, but um, Paul Golding, the, the leader there, uh, got himself in a lot of trouble. They went up, they knocked on his door, and they harassed him in the middle of the night. I don't think that's the right way to go about it, but this man is calling for a caliphate. You know, he wants to inspire hatred uh, for more London shoe bombers, for more Ariana Grande concert bombers. This man is a degenerate piece of shit, 
and uh, Britain first helped put him behind bars. Certainly, I don't agree with uh, Paul Golding or Joe Franson on everything, uh, but this is a real storm in the teacup from Theresa May. It is disgusting. And it's worth pointing out that uh, Tommy Robinson, who is easily the most uh, effective uh, spokesperson against the Islamization of the UK, he initially came from a street movement that he founded, the, the English uh, Defence League. So, you know, they're not just, you know, hotheads who, um, you know, go, go around, you know, beating their chest in the street. You know, there's actually some, you know, good activists there, and Tommy Robinson is proof of that. Well, yeah, it's, it's, what it is is, is it's uh, the leftover archaic uh, classism of Britain uh, where your, your accent really does matter. And if you're, I, I'm Tommy Robinson, you know, if you've got a bit of that going on, then you, you really are in some strife. They will denounce you as some kind of thug or, or some kind of imbecile because of your class or, or how you sound, and they will ignore or denounce what you're saying uh, when it's completely worthwhile. Now, I bet Theresa May, I bet Boris Johnson, you know, I, I bet uh, Amber Rudd, for instance, would all live behind big pearly gates, and uh, they would stare down at all Britons in their ivory tower, uh, and they wouldn't realise... Um, what the Islamification uh, is doing uh, to Britain. Now, you look at the, the rape gangs in Rotherham, the Islamic rape gangs, so tragic. Uh, police didn't want to uncover them because they were scared of being called racist. Um, and you're seeing uh, Tommy Robinson uh, being restricted, having restricted movement in his hometown of Luton. Uh, and you're seeing gag orders uh, put on people like Paul Golding, uh, for speaking out against ISIS, ISIS imams in Britain. Uh, this is the state of politics in the West at the moment. Uh, and of course, the, the the aftermath of you know Trump's uh, retweets is that uh, MPs in the the House of Commons, uh, led by uh, Shadow Home Secretary Diane Abbott, have called for Donald Trump's uh, state visit to the UK to be revoked. Now Theresa May has said she's not going to do that. Uh, though uh, Amber Rudd, her Home Secretary, said that he should uh, delete his. Uh, tw uh, Twitter account and Theresa May. She's also uh, reaffirmed that she uh, wants her government to, you know, crack down on the so-called, you know, uh, far right. Okay, now I don't know. I I don't view any people who are anti-Islam uh, in its preaching. Well, Islam is an inherently violent religion. Uh, now. Uh, you look at the first part of the Quran. Uh, Muhammad is a largely peaceful man. He, he he hung around, I believe, a Christian heretic. Um, you know, and it was it was you know it was a general decent message. But the problem is with the Quran is that the the second half of the Quran abrogates the first. So the 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 genocide, or I guess the well, the beheading of the Jews that he led, you know, killing of Jews. Uh, the uh, sleeping with the uh, nine-year-old girl, you know, all that abrogates the first half of peace and love. Now, that is the problem with Islam. That is actually a, a an Islamic um, uh, way of understanding uh, the Quran. It, it's a well-established, uh, you know, Quranic uh, kind of scholarship that most uh, Muslims follow, uh, and, and that's a real problem. Uh, if people can't uh, speak up against the Islamification of Europe, uh, if people who are deemed, uh, I deem people who are far right uh, to be skinheads uh, who want to kill all brown people. I don't deem people to be far right if they say that they don't want their 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 women to be raped in Rotherham. I don't deem people to be far right if they are sick of terrorism, and I certainly uh, don't deem. Uh, people, you know, far right, if they are, you know, really concerned about their uh, security and their liberty and their freedom in their own country. 
And we have to remember that this rhetoric is coming from an allegedly conservative government. And if this is what is coming from a conservative uh, government in the UK, then you really despair for the future of that country. Well, I, I don't really think it's... Uh, they're not far right, right? What, what is happening is it's, it's a class struggle and they want to uh, control uh, opinion. Uh, they want to be the, the sole formers of opinion and they don't want people like Britain First to actually have a voice. And uh, you're definitely seeing this through uh, the erroneous restrictions on free speech at the moment. Uh, the attacks on people like Donald Trump, purely because they don't fit into the uh, nice um, uh, political class of people who are, are well-mannered or what have you, uh, but they are outspoken and they speak the truth uh, to a large degree. Well, it's certainly going to be a, a busy end to the year, so thank you once again, Jacob, for uh, joining me on the show to uh, digest uh, uh, all that's happening, uh, not just here, but around the world. Yeah, no worries, Tim. It was good to be back on again. Uh, but I have to say this Victorian weather is very Islamic. Uh, most of the time it is very Shiite, uh, but some of the time it is quite Sunni. Uh, so, but hopefully we, we get some uh, consistency uh, in the weather and I, I hope uh, uh, everyone uh, enjoys their week to come. God bless. See you all soon. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. We are coming towards the end of the year and the Christmas break, but don't worry, the Unshackled will still be here to cover what is happening as the news never stops. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.